Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Colin, for that introduction. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to Secretary Castro, who will be joining us shortly, and to HUD for all that they do in public housing uh, across the nation. The last time I was with Secretary Castro was just over a year ago. We were both in Selma, Alabama for the 50th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, during that time, I visited a number of Selma public schools, uh, and then I joined Secretary Castro uh, as we visited a number of public housing opportunities, uh, or communities, so I'm happy uh, to be with him again here today. It's a pleasure to be here among folks doing the hard and very important work to build and sustain partnerships among school systems, housing authorities, government, and philanthropy. I know that your efforts will continue to pay dividends in the month and years ahead, uh, and we'll have more bouncing baby organizations. <laughs> As many of you know, and as Colin mentioned, one of our most important efforts in the Obama administration to expand opportunity is called My Brother's Keeper. And that name got me thinking. We probably all know the biblical story in which Cain responds to God with the words, am I my brother's keeper? In that story, Abel offers a better sacrifice to God than his brother does, and God favors Abel. Cain gets jealous and murders his brother. Not only has Cain killed his brother, but he also makes clear that he takes no responsibility for him. The first lesson I draw from that story is that we defy God when we murder our own brother. It's a lesson so obvious it barely needs to be repeated, but yet it so desperately needs to be repeated in so many urban areas across the country. And we, as a group, cannot rest in the work until we end the killing. But there's another lesson here, too, which is that we err profoundly when we try to pretend that somehow we are not responsible for our brothers and our sisters, that somehow we are not their keeper. It's a truth that humbles me. I stand here today because I was, in a sense, kept because someone took responsibility for me when I was young without a lot of advantages. Some of you may know my boss and friend, Secretary John King, had to take responsibility for himself as a child when his mother died and his father succumbed to Alzheimer's. As strange as it seems, word for word, the same is true for me. When I was coming up on the south side of Chicago, my mother died of a heart attack and my father got sick with Alzheimer's. Even when they were alive, we didn't have much. My father's work as a plasterer and a bricklayer was seasonal, and my mother did not work outside our home. After my mother died and my father got sick, things got a lot tougher. I was the oldest child, so I had the responsibility for taking care of the family. And then just a few weeks after my mom passed, uh, I was robbed at, at gunpoint. At times, we lived on food stamps, and we'd worry when they'd next turn the lights off. It was a time when life was dark for me, uh, a time where I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I comforted myself with a vision of making it big as a businessman, which for me back then meant owning the corner store. Plenty of my friends from back then are doing something like that now, and there is great dignity in running a small business. But the reason I'm here now, a lawyer serving the President of the United States, is because someone made the choice to be my keeper. For me, it was Ms. Schmidt, my 10th grade English teacher at Dunbar High School. Uh, Dunbar's on the south side of Chicago, and for those of you familiar with Chicago housing projects, uh, steps away from the famous Robert Taylor Homes uh, and Stateway Gardens. Dunbar produced as many dropouts as it did graduates, but Ms. Schmidt had big dreams for me, bigger than the dreams that I had for myself. She convinced me that I had talent. She made me feel smart. She created a safe space for learning in a world oftentimes filled with gang fights and unpaid bills. She told me to go to college, uh, and she sent me to stay with her son at the University of Illinois so that I could see that a college degree was an attainable reality. She took 
responsibility for me. Fundamentally, that idea that we will not pretend that we don't know where our brothers and sisters are, that we will take collective responsibility for them, that underlies so much of what President Obama's administration has done in education. I'm immensely proud of the fierce urgency that President Obama and former Secretary Ani Duncan have brought to the vital work of changing the odds, work that Secretary King is now redoubling in our final year in office. The number of African American and Latino students enrolled in college has risen by more than one million since President Obama took office. High school graduation rates have set a new record and dropout rates have reached a historic low. But the fact remains that the odds are still stacked against too many of our young people, especially in urban areas. A third of African American and Latino children grew up in poverty and far too many of our young brothers and sisters attend schools where expectations and discipline policies remain infected with institutional racism. This is especially true for so many of our students facing housing instability, where the challenges are even greater. For instance, we know that housing instability causes stress and worry not only for parents, but for students as well, who don't have support systems to rely on or who don't know where to turn for necessary services. All these factors can undermine academic success, and they are all reasons why we need the right people, people like you sitting in this room, working together to continue to build, to build those support systems and to make those connections between home and school. We also know that so many of the jobs that will require a young person to have a shot at the American dream also require a college degree. But our black and brown brothers and sisters, especially the brothers, aren't getting them nearly enough. About 43% of young white adults between the age of 25 and 29 complete a bachelor's degree. But only one in four young black women and only about one in five Hispanic women earn four-year degrees. Young men are even less likely to have achieved that milestone. One in six African-American young men, one in seven Hispanic young men have earned a bachelor's degree. Compare that to the odds of incarceration. One out of every three black men in America is predicted to go to prison at some point in their lives. One in three. Ask yourselves how anyone can sit idly by in the face of these facts. For our nation, for our states, for our communities, that's why it's so important to press forward with the changes of recent years. The new Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced No Child Left Behind and mandates high standards for all kids, will help with that. But I also believe that each of us in this country bears an individual responsibility to our brothers and to our sisters to truly see and help kids like the one that I was, not to pretend that we don't know where they are. That's why I believe so deeply in my brother's keeper. MBK is an ambitious effort across the entire federal government, which also brings together partners from almost every sector to improve opportunity for all young people, including boys and young men of color. It focuses on a set of milestones that really matter, from entering school healthy and ready to learn, to graduating from high school prepared for college and career and beyond. What makes me extre extremely excited about MBK is the opportunities it offers for folks in our communities, folks like you and me, to step up and become part of the solution to actually participate in changing the odds for our kids of color, especially those most at risk of becoming the statistics I've spoken about earlier this morning. You and I and adults everywhere, we can be a part of turning this around. Let me mention just a couple of ways about how we can be a part. One part of MBK that I'm especially excited about is what we're calling MBK Success Mentors. The idea here is to connect caring, trained adults to our most vulnerable students. We are starting with 30 high-need school districts with the goal of eliminating, eliminating chronic absenteeism in targeted grades, and we expect to reach over 250,000 students 
over the next three years. This is such an important issue. We know that chronic absenteeism is correlated both with students' poverty and their neighborhoods, including available housing options. We also know that public housing authorities can play a critical role in ensuring all children have the supports they need to be in school every day. The department's new chronic absenteeism toolkit launched in October includes action steps that you can take, like hosting back to school events and outreach programs, as well as access to free resources and other vital information. If you haven't had a chance to uh, see the toolkit, I encourage you all to go to ed.gov and, and take a look at it. But it's just as important for students to be engaged during the school year, including attending school regularly, and we can't forget about them during the summer. That's why I'm excited about the White House Summer Opportunity Project, which calls on school leaders, employers, and communities to invest in summer learning and increase the number of job and internship opportunities for all young people. You can play a key role all year round, but especially in the summer. You can start thinking creatively now, whether you're organizing a book drive or a job fair, directly offering summer employment or organizing enrichment opportunities in community centers. All of us play a role in helping young people navigate the pitfalls and dream a bigger dream for their lives, just as Ms. Schmidt did for me. Providing a safe, stable place for students to lay their heads, that's already very good progress. We know that students don't just live their lives at home with their families or at school with their teachers. Students need adequate support at school and at home. But I ask you, as I ask myself, what more can we do on behalf of our nation's students? There are several promising examples from across the country, and I'll only mention a couple. Take a pilot program at McCarver Elementary School in Tacoma, Washington. There, the local housing authority is working alongside the school district and foundations to provide housing vouchers in return for more family involvement at school. During the first and second years of the program, the percentage of students reading at grade level nearly doubled and remained on par with all McCarver students in year three. Or take a look at the Boulder County Housing Authority, which is working with two local school districts in Colorado. They received a home grant to identify families at risk of becoming homeless and help them set financial and educational goals. Children from participating families are matched with case managers who participate in school meetings, model appropriate behavior for parents, and encourage involvement in their children's schools. These models began as bold ideas that were acted upon. Across the board, the dream of a successful America for all, including low-income students and including students of color, requires attention to challenges in housing and in education. Our nation's children need support at home and at school. These and other similar initial initiatives require all of us as educators, as housing experts, and community leaders to give our best shot. As a nation, as individuals, we know the answer to that ancient question. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we must all be our brother's keeper. Thank you very much. There's really no better way to message uh, what these two days are about. Than